gods of Olympus have abandoned. God of War, one of the PlayStation's most successful franchises. Launching back on the PlayStation 2 in 2005, we journey with Angry Man Kratos through a deadly temple on a quest to kill Ares. But recently, with the PlayStation 5 reboot also being called God of War and its sequel Ragnarok being some of the highest rated games of all time, when people say God of War now, they mean this. Whereas I mean this. So let's go back to 2005 and replay the game which started it all. I'll be finishing the entire game and showing you all the relevant cutscenes while breaking down the mechanical choices both good and bad. So let's adventure through Athens, traverse the twisted traps of Pandora's Temple, claw our way out of Hades and then ask what the hell they were thinking with that final boss, before enjoying the secret phone call from Kratos hidden in the game's ending. So let's go forth in the name of Olympus as we ask God of War, the original from 2005, was it any good? Quick content warning, God of War is a violent, adult, gory game dealing with some pretty heavy themes of loss and death. Viewer discretion very much advised. As usual, a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch and YouTube who allow me to make these long-form videos. More on how you can support in the video description and at the end. For now, let's begin. I bought God of War when it released and I knew nothing about it. I hadn't read any reviews or seen any adverts. The box just looked really cool. So I went home, turned on my PS2 and finished the game in a single 10 hour play session. Now this wasn't normal for me, but something about the game just captivated me. It kept me playing. I wasn't playing to review or critique back then. I was just enjoying the experience. So I'm really excited personally to go back to this game and try and break down exactly what it did that made me enjoy it so much. What design choices did it make which worked? But don't worry, I'll make sure that I remove the rose tinted glasses and find aspects which did not and still do not work. First note, God of War 2005 didn't have native widescreen support. The widescreen mode it came with simply chopped off the top and bottom of the screen and then zoomed in, which isn't really actual widescreen. So the footage in this video is how the game is supposed to look. First off, the franchise is complicated. I'll show the in-universe story order on screen. You've got God of War in 2005 and the direct sequel God of War 2 in 2007. Then the mobile game Betrayal, which happens between 1 and 2. The PSP game Chains of Olympus released in 2008 and is a prequel to God of War 1. God of War 3 in 2010 for the PS3, then Ghost of Sparta for the PSP, Ascension in 2013, the Facebook game Call from the Wilds in 2018, Mermia's Vision in 2018, then the franchise reboot also called God of War for the PS4 in 2018 as well, and its sequel Ragnarok in 2022. So we are here, the first game released and the third in the chronology. So let's dive in. Pun fully intended because of this rather dark opening cutscene. Now there is no hope. And Kratos cast himself from the highest mountain in all of Greece. After ten years of suffering, ten years of endless nightmares, it would finally come to an end. Death would be his escape from madness. So before we go into the game, let's discuss the character of Kratos and how we feel about him based on what we know at any given moment. Right now we know he's a man who's given up and is so depressed he's thrown himself off a cliff just to stop whatever nightmares he's having. That's a pretty sad start. Then we cut to three weeks ago, a battle aboard a boat. Now you already know that these three weeks are going to be the journey to his cliff jump setting up a rather inevitable Greek tragedy storyline from the beginning. You're on the deck of this boat taking out some horrific monster things. It's a third person action game and if you mash some buttons you'll get some tutorial pop-ups. Press square for a light attack, triangle for a heavy attack. The game throws you into combat pretty much straight away, so let's discuss the combat system. The left analog stick moves Kratos, the right analog stick will roll in whichever direction you push. X jumps, you have a double jump as standard. Square throws a medium range light attack and triangle is a slightly closer heavy attack. Circle is grab enemy or context kill, we'll see these later, but the most unique part of the combat system are the weapons Kratos uses, the Blades of Chaos. Short, thick blades bound to his arms by chains which he throws out, so it's more of a mid-range weapon. Your range is normally greater than any other melee enemies and Mashing Square starts a lavish flurry of damage, spinning and hacking, while Triangle throws some heavy hitting attacks out, normally ending in slamming the floor. A combo of light and heavy attacks normally finishes with a heaviest attack which knocks enemies back. And if you hold Triangle, you can launch enemies into the air and then briefly juggle 
juggle them with aerial attacks. This system gets fully fleshed out later, but for now it feels chunky and substantial. The fight on the boat is intense. The camera follows Kratos as well and cannot be controlled by the player. Each area has a fixed camera angle and most of the time a transition between areas is an uncut camera fly-through, which is a much more difficult way of developing but is also a very immersive cinematic experience. Within only a few moments I'm already seeing a comparison. God of War released four years after Devil May Cry and the similarities and inspiration is obvious. Everything from the fixed camera position to the combat style, combo usage and reward, coloured orbs representing health, mana and experience, upgradable weapons which unlock new combos and powers, additional weapons later in the game, family driven narrative adventure, even down to the strange final boss, God of War draws heavily from the Devil May Cry playbook, but it does so really well. Square and Triangle use the blades, but Circle grabs. And after grabbing most human-shaped enemies, you have to make a second choice very quickly. Press Circle again to punch them until they die, and then stab them into goo on the floor. Press Square to impale them onto one of your blades, and then fling them away into another enemy as a ranged projectile. Or press Triangle to just rip them apart. All of these choices kill the enemy, it's just a satisfying thing to decide how the enemy dies. Side note, punching them generates the most red orbs because it gives the most hits and counts toward a combo meter, so if you're going to max out all items you want to do that as often as you can. Your health is shown by the green bar in the top left inside the stylized sword graphic. Later on you'll see your blue magic bar and red experience orb bar too. After killing some enemies we see more burst out of the hold and then the camera lingers on the door a little bit too long and the handle glints. This is another strong feature, visual focus given to mechanically relevant things. God of War is a master of gently showing you what it wants you to see, focusing on it just long enough that you think, hey, I want to go over there and investigate whatever that is. You can interact with doors and levers by pressing R2. Simple switches need a single press, but a heavy door needs you to keep mashing R2 repeatedly. And you can be interrupted by enemies while doing this. You're not safe while interacting with stuff. And I don't know it yet, but this design of fighting on the deck while trying to open a door is actually the key to why God of War feels so damn good to play. It's a very simple design choice and I'll explain what it is as I come to realise it. Drop down into the ship and find our first chest. Hold R2 to open. Chests contain either red orbs which are used to level our weapons and magic spells up, green orbs which refill our health, blue which refill mana, or one of two hidden upgrade items that we'll find later. Smash our way further into the ship and get told hold L1 to block. This becomes instantly relevant as a Hydra head barrels through the ship's hold toward us. Blocking in God of War is a matter of timing. Holding L1 keeps you safe from the majority of enemy attacks, but if you block just before being hit, you'll drop the game into slow-mo for a second. This will matter later when we unlock the block and retaliate skill. Throw some damage onto this Hydra and drain its HP bar until a large circle icon appears above its head. Run up and press circle. And now a cornerstone of the God of War franchise, the cinematic quick time kill event. Taking almost any enemy to low health will give you a circle icon above their head, and each cinematic kill is different but the beauty of most of them is the camera never cuts. So once you've started the event, it's a visual feast, a journey of damage that you can follow through to completion. Simply press the button which shows up. It's always one of the four shape buttons on the PlayStation controller and then just enjoy the violence. The lack of camera cuts helps the whole event feel like a complete moment, a visceral fight from start to finish cutting nothing out and this is something we'll see done again and again. God of War wants to show you the brutality and skill of Kratos. It wants you to feel involved in and responsible for every gory strike, and it wants to do it all in one take. With the Hydra head taken care of, the pounding music, which is something we'll look at later on, dies down, and we balance our way across some thin beams. And this is another lovely design trick. A roller coaster can't be all downhill excitement. You need variation within the pacing to keep the player engaged, otherwise they get overwhelmed. You need moments of calm and simple, and this moment, slow down and navigate the beams carefully, is pulling the energy down straight away. It's pacing the adrenaline spikes so the intense moments feel more intense as they're often bookended by moments of calm. The balance mechanic itself is pretty simple. If you fall, just mash X to get back up. And eventually, we meet a dude who you'd assume wants to be saved. I know who you are, Spartan. I know what you've done. I would rather die than be saved by you. Ooh, a little bit of mystery. We know Kratos takes his own life in three weeks, and we now know that people fear him so much they would rather die than be saved by him. But why? 
questions are being set up. We run onto the deck and are attacked by flying imps, annoying and hard to hit with melee attacks, but here's where the grab move comes in. Weak enemies, or tougher enemies which have been weakened, can be grabbed with circle, and this is usually a one-hit kill. But it does have some variety. We've seen with humans you have the choice of punch, launch, or rip, but with imps you'll just stamp on them and rip their wings off. It's brutal, yet satisfying. You'll notice there are also humans on the deck. Killing them gives green health orbs. Clear out the imps and another hydra head bursts through the deck and we learn about rolling. Right analog stick evades. Some attacks can't be blocked and must be evaded. Mainly magical attacks, flame based attacks or area smash effects will break your guard and stagger you backwards even if you do block them. So we hack away at the hydra and then it eats us up and here's a nice touch. Some enemies will grab you or eat you and this starts a test of strength. Just mash circle as fast as you can. And usually when you win you'll retaliate and do massive damage so being grabbed is a good thing. Kill the Hydra and jump into the hole it left through the deck. Now we can't swim yet but we can wade so we then climb further up the rigging and to climb you just move towards something climbable. We'll see this fleshed out later in the Cliffs of Madness level. Climb up the mast and more balancing. Oh we know how to do this already but now we have choices and this is another design we'll see a lot of. God of War is essentially a linear game but you've got short offshoots from the main path which usually lead to secrets. Now annoyingly it's not always obvious which is the main path and which is the optional secret, so you'll end up doubling back on yourself or even tripling back to make sure that you don't progress too far and lock yourself off from a previous secret. We make it all the way to the deck and meet a sailor. It's, it's you! The visions, they were real! The gods came to me, told me their champion would come and rescue us from the Hydra. But you're too late! We're pinned down! These creatures, they came from nowhere. The ships are all destroyed. All hope is lost, Spartan, even for you. So we have some archer snipers to deal with, but first off, saving the game. You can only save in these beams of golden godly light, and when you interact it says Zeus has given you the opportunity to save, which is a lovely bit of flavour, but will retroactively become ironic in God of War 2. After saving, let's have a quick glance at the menu, a list of all the items and god spells you can find, along with the giant red liquid filled icon on the left. The red bubbles represent your collected red orbs. Each icon fills up with 300 and then a counter simply ticks over. You spend red orbs to upgrade stuff. So let's get past these archers. And now a new mechanic, grabbing and pushing objects. Hold R2 to grab stuff and then just drag it around slowly. But this box isn't just cover from incoming arrows, because if too many arrows hit the box, it breaks. So this is not about defense, oh no, we need to use this box as a step to climb higher at the upper end of the deck. So we need to get it down without breaking. Thankfully you can hold X to charge up a kick and then just boot objects away from you. This is much faster than manually moving them. One thing you do notice about ranged enemies is they lead their shots based on your last known movements and speed. They don't fire at where you are whenever they loose their arrows, they fire at where you're going to be. So if you're running to the left when they loose, it'll be aimed to the left and will hit you if you continue running. Knowing this, you can run side to side and make them fire wildly off target. We hear some screams of women and children coming from the captain's cabin begging us to find the key and free them, so we hop up some more rigging and go looking for it. And this time, we're joined by enemies. Combat while climbing is pretty simple. Light attacks throw your blade out in a straight line, heavy slice the blade in a curve. If you're close enough, you can grab enemies and smash them into the wall, then just throw them away. Getting hit four or five times knocks an enemy down, but the same is true for you. Movement while climbing is unfortunately limited to only four directions, up, down, left and right. You cannot climb diagonally. And while you can use X to leap a small distance, you can only leap side to side or up. There is no fast way to climb down. This will be changed in God of War 2. Grab this connecting rope and slide all the way down to a new boat and find our first hidden chest with a secret item, a Gorgon Eye. If you collect six of these, you increase your maximum health. So we run inside and then meet the avatar of Poseidon. Lord Poseidon, Kratos, before you reach Athens, there is a task you must complete. This beast, this Hydra, it has terrorized my seas for far too long. Your skills are admirable, but you will need assistance. You will need the power of the gods. Take this weapon, Kratos. Take this power and use it to defeat your enemies.
Go with the gods, great host. Go forth in the name of Olympus. He gives us our first magic spell. You'll collect four of these throughout the game and they can all be upgraded with red orbs. You select which spell is active with the D-pad and cast with L2. The active spell is shown here. And you know, I never noticed this as a kid, but it's kind of strange that the spell Poseidon's Rage is an electrical storm. That seems like more of a Zeus thing. The spell itself is great though. It's a local AoE which stuns enemies, looks and sounds great, plus you're immune while casting so you can cheese some bosses with it. We'll look at that later. Eventually we find the captain's key. It's on the captain. And then the sailors shout that the big hydra head is healing the others and then we hear the famous doom scream. So the big hydra head is healing the others. Time to take this thing down, and this is our first environmental puzzle boss fight. The two smaller hydra heads are exactly the same as the ones we've already killed, except they will drag you toward them from time to time. So throw damage on, block, roll, and when you weaken them enough, you have to climb the stacks of boxes and jump onto a spiked platform to impale them to the deck. If you don't do this, they'll just keep regenerating. You have to impale both of them to make the central rigging safe enough to climb to take on the main head, which will scream at you and push you back off the rigging. Blocking stops you from falling off, but if you don't block, you'll be thrown back down below. Killing the main head is a game based on the environment. Block in all the biting attacks, roll away from the smashing ones, which is hard because this platform is much smaller, but then when you've weakened it enough, a quick time event has you smash its head into the central mast. After smashing the head into the mast three times, it splinters to a sharp point and the final quick time event will take down the Hydra. That was brutal. With the Hydra dead, we run into its stomach to rescue the captain's key, but not the captain. We don't need him. Kratos has no time for things which don't directly benefit him. Also, remember this captain as he falls into the Hydra's gullet, because the game loves callbacks. With the key in hand, we can go and rescue the women and children from the captain's quarters and... Oh. Slaughtered like animals, the victims lay before him, a reminder of his own past, a past he could never escape. His only solace was the sea, endlessly sailing from one harbor to the next in service to the gods of Olympus. All his hopes rested with them. Unfortunately, I can't show you every cutscene because boobs. Ten years, Athena. I have faithfully served the gods for ten years. When will you relieve me of these nightmares? We request one final task of you, Kratos. Your greatest challenge awaits in Athens, where even now my brother Ares lays siege. As we speak, Athens is on the verge of destruction. It is the will of Ares, my great city fall. Zeus has forbidden the gods from waging war on each other. That is why it must be you, Kratos. Only a mortal trained by a god has a chance at defeating Ares. And if I am able to do this, to kill a god, then the visions, they will end? Complete this final task, and the past that consumes you will be forgiven. Have faith, Kratos. The gods do not forget those who come to their aid. Leaving the rotting carcass of the Hydra behind, Kratos set sail once more. His greatest challenge and freedom from his growing madness lay before him in the ancient city of Athens. A small touch I noticed about that cutscene and really like is how Kratos says if. 
if I can save the city from Ares. He knows he's tough, but he still doubts himself. And so the journey to Athens begins. We jump to Kratos enjoying some quality time on a bed with two women, and I'll have to skip some cutscenes because YouTube seems to be fine with gamified violence, but it's still a bit iffy with gamified nudity. But this does give us one of the strangest Easter eggs in a game. If you jump back on the bed and press circle, you'll start a satisfaction quick time event, and if you win, you get many, many red orbs. When we arrive at the Athens dock, notice how the camera zooms out to give this wide establishing shot. This is still gameplay. You can still move. It's cinematic without removing control from the player, which is rare. We leave the boat and now a new mechanic. Enemies sometimes have powerful attacks. These usually have a visual particle effect like a flourish of colour, like these big blue sword swings. This is a sign to block. Thankfully, blocking cancels any of your basic attack animations and so you can do it as a response, but you cannot cancel the animation of a special god move or a roll. So committing to a god combo or a roll does mean losing the ability to animation cancel for a second. These enemies are also stronger and can't be grabbed until weakened, meaning no more one-hit kills for anything. With enemies getting tougher, we pour some of the orbs into the Blades of Chaos and level them up, unlocking three new abilities. Holding L1 and pressing X will now launch enemies into the air, and if done while in the air, we'll slice them multiple times and slam them back onto the ground, bouncing them back up into the air. Pressing R1 on the floor is now a shoulder charge, knocking enemies back, or a kick if you're in the air, and now we have a rage meter. Fighting fills it, and when it's full, unleash the fury of the gods by pressing L3 and R3 at the same time, and you'll become a super-powered Spartan Kratos for about half a minute. You get this cool ghostly armor glow and a complete new moveset which does way more damage. You also cannot be stunned or knocked back while in rage mode. Another hidden chest gives us the second of these secret items, a phoenix feather. Collect six of these to increase your magic meter. Push on to save Athens and now a new enemy type. Run! All new or mechanically unique enemies have intro cinematics when you first meet them. The Minotaur will be one of the most reskinned enemy models in the whole game. While their weapons will change, the basic attack structure of a Minotaur stays the same. If you attack with too many light attacks, they'll start blocking you, then knock you back, and then hit a heavy attack of their own. But if you can weaken them, you can then press circle to start a battle of strength, jumping onto them and stabbing them through the mouth with your blades. Killing a Minotaur in this way will always give green health orbs. And this is a simple yet extremely effective design trick. In games, you reward the behavior you want the player to engage in. Like how in the reboot of Doom, they didn't want players with low health to run away from a fight and look for a medkit. They wanted players to be aggressive, so they rewarded glory kills with health. Same principle here. If the player is low on health, you want them to find a Minotaur. You want the player thinking, yes, I am saved, you are doomed you reward that player's brutality. While God of War isn't divided into levels as much, the linear gameplay path does have several offshoots of it which loop around. Now, each loop is self-contained, and there aren't any shortcuts or cutbacks. Consider the main game a straight line, and each secret section its own distraction. It means you can't ever get too lost, but if you do miss a secret loop, you'll never find your way back to it. Another new enemy, the giant spiked ball hand. Now, this guy hits really hard and can't be blocked, so dodging and aerial attacks are needed. And this highlights a lovely use of the combat system. Different enemies require different approaches. While you can use one style against everything, it's not optimal. Sometimes blocking will be needed. Other times, it's pointless. Sometimes slow, heavy hits are the best. Other times, you need to grab. Each enemy is a mini puzzle by themselves, and killing them simply means solving the puzzle, and this simple design choice will matter a lot later. One thing you do notice about the quick time events, like the Minotaur mouth stab, is they all need the same camera angle. Because the camera is fixed and follows Kratos effectively on a rail, the quick time kills are only shown from a single angle. And when you press circle to start one, the first few frames of that kill are always awkwardly spinning the enemy model into the correct position. It's jarring when you first notice, but then you do quickly stop caring. Now you'll notice that some of the chests start to switch between green for health and blue for magic. When you press R2 to grab a chest, it will remain on whatever colour it was when you grabbed it, and not, as I used to believe as a kid, 
keep changing even while you're holding it. By forcing the player to pick between regenerating their health and refilling their magic, you're making the player constantly question what they need more. Do I burn through mana now and then open the chest on blue and hope that I don't need health later? Or do I save the mana for a boss later and fight knowing that I've got some health in this chest as a backup? It's a choice. Moreover, it's a choice which only solves one of two problems that you'll have at any given time. And that design idea, multiple problems, that's one step closer to the secret behind God of War's brilliance. Every now and then you'll run into a zigzag corridor, and I never realised this as a kid, but just like Siphon Filter, these are loading zones, transitions between massive outside areas designed to seamlessly unload the old and load in the new and keep the player moving forward and have you never notice the change. After the intensity of the battle, another moment of calm, a puzzle. The camera switches to a top-down view and we can see a chest. So already the player has a point of reference. Chests are good, therefore we should probably get here. But how? There are stacks of boxes, but you can't quite make it. But hang on, one of them is wooden. So we destroy that box, and the stack drops down, and now you can make it. Even something as simple as a jumping puzzle has another layer of complexity to it. And when we make it all the way around the room, the camera pans over and reveals that there was a secret chest behind us just out of camera shot this whole time. Because the camera isn't player control, the camera position itself is a game mechanic and can be used to hide secrets from us. This room reveals the game will do that, and now you'll always be checking just out of sight areas for secrets. Onwards, and we reach the second god spell. Aphrodite. Kratos, the gods are pleased with your progress, but your current skills will not be enough to defeat the minions of Ares. I offer you the power to freeze your enemies where they stand, but you must earn such a gift. Medusa, the queen of the Gorgons. Bring me her head, Kratos, and I will give you the ability to wield its power. So Aphrodite wants us to fight Medusa, and as a reward, we'll get Medusa's head. Now, Medusa is fast, so heavy attacks are pointless because she will avoid them. That also means we need to do lots of rolling and blocking. When you weaken her enough, the quick time event to kill Gorgons isn't push buttons or mash circle, it's match the rotation of the analog stick to the on-screen prompt to rip their head off. With Medusa's head cleanly removed from her body, we get the second spell, the Stone Beam. Hold it onto an enemy long enough to turn them into stone, then attack them to shatter them. Honestly, I never used this much as a kid, and you can play through most of the game without using it, but not the entire game, because combat sometimes is needed for puzzles. Check out this soldier folded over a beam in the foreground while we climb a ladder. Nothing mechanical, just a lovely visual touch. You know, in God of War, there's always something visual going on. We find a ballista, and pulling it back fires a massive bolt, but it's also on a rotating pedestal, so we spin it round, and while I know this is likely the right way, I also assume if I rotate it more and fire it again, and yeah, there we go! Unlock some secrets, baby! Here's a small visual touch I love. This wall is climbable, but we've never had to climb a wall like it before, so how would a player know it's climbable? Well, there's part of a ladder leaning up against it, and you've climbed ladders earlier, so you try to climb this ladder, and you effortlessly transition onto the wall. And now the player knows the design of this wall is climbable. Using previous knowledge to encourage a behaviour and rewarding that behaviour with new knowledge is great design. Traverse the wall with this gorgeous background view of the city at war, and then push a statue over to create a a new path onto the opposite rooftop, and while the levels may be linear in nature overall, they're extremely densely packed and loop back and forth within themselves. The critical path to complete this section crosses over itself and back through itself several times as new paths open up from the same location. Medusas are now regular enemies, and while killing a Minotaur always gives health, killing a Medusa always gives mana. By now the fights are frequent, but small and intense. They are never more than five or six enemies on screen at any time, but each enemy is dangerous, and as each enemy takes a certain approach to kill, and fights are usually a mix of enemies, every fight needs you to deal with balancing multiple approaches. Right, I have finally found the first major graphical mistake of the game. Watch the camera viewpoint as you jump and grab this rope bridge. 
See how it was on one side of Kratos for the entire fight and then suddenly switches to the other side instantly with a cut? This is breaking a filmmaking principle called the 180 rule. Basically, the camera can exist for any shot on one specific side of a circle, never cross beyond 180 degrees from its furthest position. This transition does that, and it feels jarring. But let's be honest, if breaking the 180 rule once is so far my biggest complaint, we're doing pretty well. Hey look, we've looped around to a locked door that I recognised from earlier, but now I can open it, and there's a wooden door I need to open beyond that, and it's the ballista from earlier. Oh, God of War does a great job of showing you all the tools you'll need to complete a task, and then slowly giving you that task in increasing complexity, and then more tasks related to it, and letting you realise, oh, I know how to do this. Like many of you are probably thinking, can you use the ballista to shoot the minotaurs? And yes, you can. I jump down this ladder and find a secret chest completely by accident, and then on our journey to save the city, we finally make it to the Oracle's Temple. Do not fear, Kratos. I am the Oracle of Athens, here to help you defeat Ares. Find my temple to the east, and I will show you how to murder a god. So, we need to find the Oracle to get the secret to stopping Ares. From this overlook, you've got two paths, one to the city and the other to this giant Oracle guarded door. We can't go through here yet, but note how it's massive. And then note how this fantastic shot of Ares wrecking the city always makes sure to keep the model of Kratos smaller than the distant model of Ares. You as a player are being made to feel small. Even this far away, Ares dominates you. Visual reinforcement that Kratos is powerful, but compared to Ares, you are nothing. And now another puzzle. A button opens a door, but it's on a timer, and you can't get there in time before it closes. There's a Minotaur in the room, and a bottomless mana chest. So how do we solve this? Make the Minotaur stand on the button and run? Nope, that doesn't work. Run around and hope the Minotaur hits the button? Doesn't work either. Eventually you figure it out. You need to use the Medusa's Gaze spell to turn the Minotaur to stone while they are standing on the button and then run. What a lovely blend of spell mechanic, platforming mechanic, and timing mechanic all tied together with an enemy. Fight through these city streets, smashing into some houses and stealing their red orbs and secret items. I do love the dynamic battle damage of the raging war, corners being blown off houses and enemies in the distance falling to the archer's arrows. God of War seems to have taken the design approach of, yes, but what else is happening? Yes, the player's in a house, but what else is happening in the distance? The foreground, what's the battle looking like? There's always something happening beyond Kratos. Finally, find the sixth Gorgon Eye and increase my health. Not a lot, but it will matter later. Throw some more red orbs into the blades and level them up again, unlocking two new mechanics. Hold L1 and press square to spin around like a helicopter and hit everything with lots of weak attacks. And then possibly the best mechanic. Blocking now has a parry response. As long as you block at the last minute, and you'll know that you've done that because the slow-mo effect happens, pressing square will now retaliate with a wide slash, pressing triangle will retaliate with an overhead smash, and R1 will charge forward and stab. As a huge fan of Dark Souls, realising that God of War had a timed parry and repost mechanic a good four years before Demon Souls came out is quite interesting. A new travel mechanic, rope swings. Hold circle to swing in whatever direction you're facing. You are over a safe pit, so falling doesn't mean death, just means try again until you succeed, which is a perfect way to introduce a player to a new mechanic. Reach the town square and take on two massive trolls at the same time. The issue here, and thankfully this doesn't happen again, is the crowd of fleeing civilians. Once you've weakened the troll enough to get the circle to appear above their head, you go forward to perform the quick kill event and instead grab a random dude running past and just stab him to death. And by the time that's done, the troll has recovered. Covered, and you can't get them into a quick time twice. Oh yeah, that giant circle has a timed window to be activated, otherwise you just have to kill it normally, but you don't get whatever your brutal kill reward would have been. Health, mana, or extra red orbs. Now this fight is mandatory because another design God of War has lifted almost directly from Devil May Cry is the red ghostly barrier that appears across an arena's exits whenever a fight starts. And these barriers only die when every enemy is killed. Seriously, it's almost a one-to-one -one copy of the red ghost wall, right down to the impression of a skull reaching out from the wall and then shattering when it's broken. They could have had a small animation after the fight like some rubble falling and revealing a new path or an icon of Ares cackling 
rumbling and fading away, but no, they literally did exactly what Devil May Cry 1 did. Run inside and god damn, how shiny is this floor? I know reflections aren't difficult nowadays, but back in 2005, high quality reflections were really impressive graphically. And maybe I'm just an aging millennial, but something about reflections in shiny textures in games still really impresses me. There is a strange woman ahead of us who keeps demanding that we stay away, and while we're not chasing her specifically, we are going this way, which unfortunately ends with... Stay away! Don't come near me! Keep away! That's probably the first death I feel bad about. She died out of fear. And as a player, you still don't know what it was that Kratos did that caused everybody to be so deathly afraid of him. So here we've got a locked hatch, but the woman who fell has a key. We can't jump back up, so we jump down, grab the key, and then run back through the shiny building again, and a new enemy, a shield bearer. Now, the square button light attacks won't hurt these guys, so you need to use the square-square triangle combo to smash the ground and break the shield. Remember how every enemy is a puzzle and must be approached differently. The game designers actually he sat down and said, what if an enemy needed you to use a specific combo to weaken them or make them vulnerable? This shows that a great deal of thought went into making all of the various combat mechanics relevant at least once in the game, from petrifying the Minotaur on the button to the combo smashing of the shields. They give you a reason to use the skills you have at least once, but then left you free to finish the fight however you liked after you'd used them. And I respect that. And then we see them do it again. The Medusa enemies will try to petrify you. You can't block this, and if you jump, you'll get petrified while you're in the air and shatter and die the moment you hit the floor. But if you roll, it resets the petrify state. This means with shield bearers, imps, medusas, and minotaurs all attacking you at the same time, you need to combine the skills of grabbing the imps to kill them in one hit, power attacking to break the shields, rolling to avoid the medusa, and quick time killing to kill the minotaur. In God of War, multiple enemies in a group doesn't just mean more bags of health on screen, it means multiple approaches to combat will be required. Open the trapdoor from earlier and push on through the city. We climb the ivy growing on the buildings and then double jump back and forth up the buildings, all the while watching Ares demolish the city in the distance. And then a new enemy, the Bladed Wraith. They can phase into the floor and spin towards you, and you have to block them as they pop up and hit you. And then you have to hold the block after the first hit, otherwise they follow up with a cheeky combo of a second hit when they fall down. And if you miss the first block, you're guaranteed to be hit by the second. This is the first enemy where you need to use block as a strategy and you should avoid rolling because rolling into them is bad. But they're joined by a giant spiked ball holding troll, one of the enemies you can't block and need to roll away from. And this is the moment that I realise why I love God of War, its combat and its puzzles so much. It's never just one problem. Every situation in a video game is, on some level, a puzzle. It's a challenge. The player wants a certain outcome, but the mechanics of the game prevent it. Overcoming these mechanics essentially is gameplay. Now, the easiest way to design is one problem, one cause, one solution, one goal. The player needs to be somewhere, or defeat something, or find something, and there's one thing stopping them from doing that. The enemy has health. The room is a maze. The object is hidden. But good games stack multiple, smaller mechanics together, and they often set the solutions to these concurrent problems at odds with each other. For example, you need to move a box, but there are archers firing at you. You can hide behind the box to solve the archer problem, but the box breaks. So you must kick the box, but now you're not safe. Not just one problem. You need to open a door, so there's a button, but there's an enemy attacking you. You want to kill the enemy, but they're part of the puzzle to open the door, so you need to freeze them. You need to block the wraith, so you stand still and block, but you can't block the trolls, so you roll, but you roll into a wraith. You need to power attack to break a shield, but this means performing a combo. And you cannot animation interrupt or animation cancel a combo with a roll or a block, but you need to make sure you are rolling to avoid being petrified, which would break your combo. God of War is, forgive the pun, god tier at combining multiple small smaller problems into the same situation and then having them interact in competing ways. And now I've noticed it, I want you to try and notice it too. I'm going to point out almost every time the game does it, I'm going to call it the never one problem school of design. And in the brief moments where the game does feel boring or dull, and there are a few of them, it's because it only has one problem at that exact moment. Like here. We've fought on and now we need to climb the ivy around a pillar and jump to another. That's a platforming problem. But then we've got archers shooting at us and if they hit us, we'll be knocked off course and die. That is an enemy problem. To solve the archer problem, just stay behind the pillar. But that doesn't solve the platforming problem. 
the solutions are at odds with each other. Or on the rooftops, fighting minotaurs and imps. If I was just fighting imps, I'd grab and pull the wings off. If it was just minotaurs, I'd jump in the air and aerial attack. But every enemy covers the weakness of the other, and if you jump from roof to roof, the imps will knock you down. Never one problem. Now this dude won't release a bridge lever, and we have no ranged attacks. Two problems. So time to explore a bit. Inside the temple there's a movable ballista, but it's not pointing at anything relevant. But there is a lever to access a ladder, which also happens to spin this floor tile because the ladder is connected by a chain. So by putting the ballista on it and then pulling, moving and pulling again, we can spin the ballista around 180 and blast open a door. Earlier we had a ballista facing a door, and before that we had a spin puzzle. So you've had no choice but to see how all these mechanics work on their own and now you're given a movable ballista, a door and a method to spin. So you combine all the current tools with your knowledge of what's happened previously to solve the puzzle. This gets us into the next room and the next god spell. This one from Zeus. Lord Zeus. Kratos, you grow stronger as your journey continues. But if you are to succeed in your quest, you will need my aid. I offer you the power of the greatest of all the gods, the father of Olympus. I offer you the power of Zeus. Take this weapon, Kratos. Take this power and use it to defeat your enemy. And if you're thinking, I know that voice, yes you do. That's Paul Eiding. He voiced Roy Campbell in Metal Gear Solid. In fact, the God of War voice cast is really interesting. The narrator is Grandmother Willow, Kratos is Mace Windu, Ares is Spike Spiegel, and Hades is frickin' Nolan North. No matter how hard you try, you cannot escape Nolan North. The power of Zeus now becomes our only ranged attack, launching lightning bolts at enemies. I actually like how our ranged is limited by our magic. This adds another layer of mana or health choice you make when you find a switching box. A ranged attack means we can take out the guy holding the bridge shut and reach the Oracle. The level has looped again and now we're above the town square from earlier, another example of dense design. And then this battle along the cliffside sees the camera track horizontally giving the whole thing a side-scrolling beat-em-up feel. Reaching the Temple of the Oracle, we're attacked by harpies with dive-bombing flame attacks, so you want to keep jumping. But then they've got medusas, so you want to stay on the floor and keep rolling and not get petrified. Never just one problem. Take out the group and before going into the temple we meet a strange old man. Good, my boy, good. Athena has chosen wisely. I knew it was so. Who are you? So, you have the blades, the skin as pale as the moon. You are the one indeed. Perhaps Athens will survive at that. <laughs> but be careful. Don't want you dying before I'm done with this grave. A grave? In the middle of a battle? Who will occupy it, old man? You will, my son. Oh, I've got a lot of digging to do indeed. All will be revealed in good time. And when all appears to be lost, Kratos, I will be there to help. I like how Kratos has this begrudging respect for people who don't seem to fear him and seem to be competent at their job and just seem to get on with it. As for why someone is digging our own grave, another mystery. We find a sixth feather and upgrade the magic meter, that's going to matter when we get the highest level spell. So we head inside the Oracle's temple and fight what seems to be an endless wave of harpies. Now you need to ascend to the second level and cross the roof beams but the harpies will knock you off so you kill them but more appear. And this is because they are actually endless, the harpies will never stop spawning from these tunnels in the walls. This means eventually you'll probably need some health, but the only health chest is behind this movable statue, so you move the statue while being attacked, and you eventually realise you need to plug the hole with the statue. 
The game has made you interact with all the needed tools. The problem is now kill the harpies to stay safe, but that isn't moving the statue. So move the statue while being attacked and take damage. It's a balance. It's never just one problem. With the holes blocked up, we balance along the beams above us, but as with anything, beams fall around you as you go, because if combat and puzzles need to follow the never just one problem design, then navigation needs that visually. Stuff happens around you which doesn't directly affect you, but keeps the scene dynamic. Even while platforming, there's always something else happening. Fight through the corridors and reach the Oracle. She's hanging on a rope. We are in a courtyard and need to figure out a way up. And unlike Ragnarok, there's no annoying child to explain the puzzle ten seconds after you've looked at it. In fact, quite the opposite. The Oracle will keep yelling at you to help while offering no advice at all. This is the first time that a puzzle, usually a part of the game designed to be lower stress and lower tension to serve as a break between the intensity, is used in an intense way. And this shows the game designers understand what causes intensity beyond combat. So it's not just jump from ivy to ivy, it's wait for the wheels to stop spinning, and then it's a rope swing, and then a balance beam, all while timed, and finally a heroic dive to save her. And with this, we get a touch more backstory about Kratos. No, I, I can't. We must not stop. And when the oracle Kratos. looked into his soul, she saw a beast as well as a man. Once a captain in the Spartan army, Kratos had begun his command with only 50 soldiers. But soon his numbers grew to the thousands. His tactics were brutal, but effective. Drunk with power, he was feared by all, except one. His wife was the only one to brave his fury. How much is enough, Kratos? When will it end? When the glory of Sparta is known throughout the world. The glory of Sparta. You did this for yourself. His desire for conquest knew no bounds, but that which he desired would ultimately consume him. Choose your enemies wisely, Kratos. Your brute strength alone will not be enough to destroy Ares. Only one item in the world will allow you to defeat a god. Pandora's box, which lies far beyond the walls of Athens, hidden by the gods across the desert to the east. But be warned, Kratos. Many have gone in search of Pandora's box. None have returned. This is a really interesting narrative flow, because our first experience of Kratos from a narrative point of view was him jumping to his own death. Now for most players this is a very sad extreme thing, so your relationship to Kratos will start from a point of sympathy. But then it's slowly revealed, actually this guy was horrific and maybe you shouldn't be so sympathetic, but because we opened with sympathy, that's the emotion we as players are anchored to, and every revelation is filtered through the lens of sympathy. And you as a player are still on some level feeling sorry for Kratos, almost looking for a justification, a spark of redemption, as these horrific truths are revealed to you even though you know they are awful truths. So we need to go and find Pandora's box, a treasure hidden in the desert which contains the power to grant us, a mortal, god-killing abilities. We leave the Oracle's temple and run across this amazing sword bridge. Now not only is this an imposing set piece, it's also going to be very relevant later. Along with the level routes themselves, physically crossing back and forth, the environment and the narrative do the same thing. The the sword bridge leads us to a spiral staircase going down to the sewers, because if Devil May Cry had that spiral staircase camera angle, so are we. There's nothing special about the sewer area, just a straight line battle, except the archers now have exploding arrows which explode a few seconds after hitting the floor. So you want to roll around to avoid them, but you're fighting minotaurs which can be blocked, so you want to stand still and fight them. Never just one problem. Back into the city and we go to the Overlook from earlier. With the Oracle's blessing, those huge imposing doors are now open. They also throw some more red orbs into the Blades of Chaos and reach level 4, unlocking the L1 plus triangle attack, a front flip heavy slam attack on the ground, or a triple front flip in the air, and then the triple R1 barge, stab, multi-stab combo. We can now also press X straight after rolling to chain the roll into a jumping slice, giving us even more choices to solve more problems when we are rolling and would rather be attacking. The giant gate takes us to the desert, of lost souls and the search for Pandora's temple begins. Kratos, the journey forward is perilous, but one you must complete if you are to have any hope of saving Athens. The oracle spoke of Pandora's box. Can it be real? The box exists. It is the most powerful weapon a mortal can wield. And with such a weapon, I could defeat Ares. With the box, many things become possible. And so it is hidden well. 
far across the desert of lost souls. There is safe passage through the deadly sands, but only those who hear and follow the siren's song will discover it. You must find the sirens, Kratos. Only they can guide you to Kronos, the Titan. A Titan lives? Kronos is the last. Zeus has commanded him to wander the desert endlessly, the Temple of Pandora chained to his back, until the swirling sands rip the very flesh from his bones. Stay true to the song of the Siren Kratos. Your journey begins here. Pray it leads you back to Athens with Pandora's box. So the temple is strapped to the back of a titan. Titans don't feature too much in God of War 1, but by the time we reach 2 and 3, they become a tad more relevant. The way to Kronos the Titan is hidden, guarded by three sirens who roam the desert, so we need to find the sirens and kill them to open the sirens' temple and thus find Kronos. Only one problem, the desert is a massive open zone full of sandstorms and navigation is almost impossible. To find the sirens, you need to wander around until you hear one of them singing, follow the sound and then kill them, and they are fast and often guarded by Minotaur. So you can't see very well, need to use fast attacks, but also deal with the slower attacking minotaurs. Never just one problem. Killing the sirens isn't difficult, it's just time consuming, and with all three killed, we go back into their temple. There is a moving conveyor belt sending us toward a crusher wheel, which is a problem, we need to run against it to make progress. But the jump at the end of this run is too high, which is a problem, so we need to push a block against the actual moving conveyor belt itself while being attacked by enemies, which is a problem. Through the temple we reach the first blasting horn which parts the sand and allows us to make our way to Kronos. And then the second blasting horn is whisked away and now we need to fight all three sirens at once. But this feels really strange. It feels simple. It feels flat. And then I realised why this is the first moment the game felt boring. Because while there are three sirens, there's only one problem. Kill the sirens. There's no environmental challenge. No platforming challenge, no competing or conflicting strategies against various types of enemies, no timer, no advantage to be gained or disadvantage to be avoided. This is just a straight up case of one problem three times, not three different problems at the same time. And this is why this is one of the most forgettable fights in the entire game. With the sirens dead, we can finally call Kronos. <laughs> Kronos, the last of the mighty titans, emerged from the desert sands. On his back, Pandora's temple awaited, massive and patient, ready to challenge all who went in search of its guarded treasure. For three days, Kratos climbed the sheer walls of the mountain. He knew he would either recover Pandora's box or perish inside the cursed temple. Now the entire Pandora's Temple section is a masterclass in looping puzzles, densely packed platforming and interconnected paths all mixing. The camera even zooms out to really enhance the enormity of the place as Kratos runs across the bridge and again this is gameplay, not cutscene. The camera focuses on a pyre but we can't jump up to it so we loop around, pull some steps out from this rock and jump up them as they slide back in. See, even a step puzzle. Problem one, you need to jump up some steps. Problem two, they're moving back into a wall. Even something as simple as a step puzzle is more engaging if there are multiple mechanical challenge layers to it. And once we have jumped up, we meet the Pyre Man. So you think you can conquer the Temple of the Gods, do you? It's never been done, you know. Sooner or later, the Harpies will bring what's left of you back for me to burn. The Gods hid Pandora's box in here, so no mortal would ever claim its power. And yet, year after year, I open the gate for more and more soldiers and place more and more bodies on these pyres. If I were you, I'd leave now. But I can see you are determined. Very well. May the gods grant you strength to conquer the perils that lay before you. Good luck, Spartan.
Here's a nice little flavour touch. If you examine the pyre, it explains the dead adventurers are recycled and used as enemies inside the temple. A new enemy type. Massive trolls, which actually opens up a new tactic. You can't move through enemy models, so if you balance your aerial attacks right, you can actually push yourself back up into the air and be able to stay in a spinning aerial attack combo until the giant thing dies. Finally, we head into the temple, and this is the main portion of the game. Pandora's temple is extensive, and finding the box is basically 70% of the entire game. While many people see God of War as this realm-spanning epic adventure, the first game largely takes place inside a massive puzzle temple. This book plinth lets you know this temple was built under the instruction of Zeus to secure Pandora's box, and the temple itself was built by Pathos Verdes III, the chief architect to the gods. And in a lovely narrative touch, as we learn more about Pathos and explore the temple, we will learn how his twisted downfall draws parallels with Kratos' own life. Inside, the temple is mainly focused on three giant concentric rings, the Rings of Pandora, and progress is all about aligning these three rings via puzzles around them. The traps start off vanilla enough, spiked walls smashing into each other and levers opening doors and resetting traps we've just conquered. The first room we reach even has a large body of water and a tunnel at the bottom, but we can't swim. Not yet. Pulling some levers gets us this handle on the outside ring, and this lets us rotate the ring itself and spin the opening to access various paths. Now, due to the camera angle, as a kid, I was never sure if it's the ring you're on that's moving, or the ring stays still while the temple moves around it. But here's an interesting secret. You can only move the handle one way. So the first new path you reach is this door with two Golden Muse statues missing. Now, this is actually a totally optional secret, but it's also the first new path the player will open when taking the critical path through the game, so a player is always likely to walk down here, which means it's a secret that they wanted you to be aware of. Finding it is intentional, but actually solving it is a choice you have to actively go back and make. We fight into the temple and begin the challenge of Atlas, and we very quickly find our next godly gift. Not a spell this time, but a new weapon. Kratos, the gods demand more of you. You have learned to use the Blades of Chaos well. But they alone will not carry you to the end of your task. I offer you the very blade I used to slay a titan. Take this gift and use it to complete your quest. Take this weapon, Kratos. Take this power and use it to defeat your enemies. The Blade of Artemis. You can switch between your two weapons by pressing R1 and L1 together. This is a weapon everyone used for exactly five minutes, purely out of curiosity, and then switch back to the Blades of Chaos. Look, I get what you were trying to do, to give the player choice, but by now most players have invested a good amount of orbs into leveling up the Blades of Chaos, and the moveset of the blades isn't just about damage. It's about breaking shields, launching into the air, blocking and reposting. It's about the range. The Blades of Chaos have reach. They keep the enemies at bay. The Blade of Artemis does not. Kratos was originally designed with the Blades of Chaos because the team behind the game said a simple sword would be too dull. They wanted their main character to have something fantastical and unique. And the Blades of Chaos are so interesting, both visually and mechanically, and by now they've been so invested in, there's no real reason to use anything else. Now in God of War 2 and 3, the weapon variety does increase substantially and you get the choice earlier, so you're not too heavily invested in a single weapon, but here, the Blade of Artemis is basically forgettable. A button puzzle next. This switch makes a hidden door spin, accessing another room. But we need to be back there when the button is pressed for the spin to affect us. Solution? Charge a kick onto a box, kick it onto the switch, and run back. What I love about this design is, it's clearly born out of the designer looking at the button mechanic, looking at the box moving mechanic, and saying, you know, we don't have a puzzle where kicking is actually needed yet, so we should put one in. They have mined every mechanic for its interaction with every other mechanic and then exhausted all the possible interactions. When I say limitation breeds creativity, this is what I mean. If you have a limited moveset, by God, you're going to find every possible way to combine it. Kicking isn't just a fun way to move things anymore. It's required. It's a part of this puzzle's solution. Slight graphical issue with the Blade of Artemis when you open the chest. So if you have the blade equipped, it defaults back to the Blades of Chaos on your back. This door needs two decorative shields to unlock, so off we go to find them. I cross this balance beam, but some archers shoot me off. 
That's two problems, balancing while being shot. So I go and kill the archers, problem solved there, and then I balance across the beam, problem solved there. Both problems create a difficult situation when combined, but both of them are easy to solve if you focus on them one at a time. Beautiful design. This switch lowers a stone deeper into the temple, and this lets us climb down the rope the stone is tied to. And then we swing across this rope bridge, and now we have enemies approaching from both directions. And you can still attack while swinging, but my attention is drawn to the battle in the background. Now, narratively, who are these soldiers? We had to go through a serious amount of trouble to even find this temple, and you're telling me there's just an army of people already here? How? Grab the decorative shields and trigger this wall to start moving, and enemies spawn in and start attacking. So we're fighting in a slowly shrinking arena, and we're on a timer because if we don't fight fast enough, we get crushed. So we can't be defensive, we need to be aggressive, but we need to be defensive because there are so many enemies attacking at once. Never just one problem. Place both shields on the door, unlock more of the temple, and god damn, this guy was not messing around when it comes to traps. You know, when I was a kid, I loved cheesy pulp adventure novels, the dungeon dives or magical treasure troves, and these kind of impossible traps were the bread and butter of high fantasy adventure. I love this stuff. Impossible, dangerous, excessive traps just make me happy. From bladed discs on the floor with two separate switches needed to be pulled quickly to open a door, which itself is then on a timer, to moving floors and crushing rollers. God of War is a masterclass in lots going on, but it's not overwhelming because you understand every individual bit that the puzzle is made up of. Climbing up some cliffs around the outside of the temple, and then this room, and oh, this is anxiety. It's obvious the floor is going to open because it's a giant trapdoor and keeps being hit by something from underneath. But you don't know when. All you can do is kill everything as fast as you can, and the enemy variety keeps your tactics changing while also hoping the floor doesn't fall away from under you, and then we're okay. This room gives us the Handle of Atlas. I find another sixth Gorgon Eye, and the Minotaurs have been upgraded. These ones are faster, which seems like a simple change, but it's throwing my block timings off. You see, I'd conditioned myself to block when I spot a Minotaur weapon being held aloft. But now I need to block as it's being lifted. These small changes actually affect gameplay quite a lot. I can't commit to stronger combos because combos can't be animation cancelled by blocking. Basic attacks can. We stick the handle into a giant statue of Atlas and set him into position. We also find the first secret muse key hidden behind him and then pull a lever to make Atlas launch the stone boulder through a wall. You know this lever could have just been next to Atlas or somewhere else on the level, but looping level design put it on the ledge above, which also gives us this lovely shot of the boulder bouncing just under the ledge, reinforcing the precision the architect has built this temple with. And by now you truly do feel like you're taking on a puzzle built by someone extremely good at making puzzles. And this apparent skill of design makes the whole thing feel like a back and forth of brains versus brawn, Kratos versus the architect. You've read about him, and he's personified by the temple itself. This entire section has a personality. It feels almost respectful of you as a challenger, two skilled combatants taking each other on. Completing the challenge of Atlas leads us to the tomb of the architect's youngest son, who died while the temple was still being built, and in his creeping madness, the architect designed a lock to need his son's skull as a key. So we rip it from his dead corpse, which leads us to learning even more about Kratos. The wrecked bodies of those who had gone in search of Pandora's box lay before him, and at once Kratos knew who was responsible. For this was not the first time he'd seen the ruined Ares, and his minions had left in their wake. Kratos had experienced it firsthand years before. The youngest and boldest captain in the Spartan army, Kratos inspired fierce loyalty in his men. It had always been enough to carry them through any battle, until this day. The barbarians to the east numbered in the thousands and descended on the Spartans without mercy. The battle lasted near hours.
The discipline and training of the Spartans did little to stem the tide of the merciless barbarians. The soldiers faced a massacre, while their young captain faced the end of his brilliant career and his life. But to Kratos, victory was worth any price, even his soul. Ares! Destroy my enemies, and my life is yours. That desperate call for aid would come to haunt Kratos for all his days. By the gods, what have I become? So Kratos was a skilled human soldier in his own right, but also a desperate man, and when faced with the ultimate loss, he sacrificed his soul for guaranteed victory. Knowing that he values victory over his own life, we're left to wonder what happened to make him want to end it. Fighting our way back to the central rings, and we slam the sun's skull into a door to open it, and now a lovely looping puzzle sequence where the never just one problem design philosophy really kicks in. You're chased by a giant spiked rolling cylinder, but when we finally reach some steps and escape, we need to reach a ladder, and this means riding the cylinder around the ring to reach it. A trap becoming a required platforming element is brilliant. Outside, we begin the challenge of Poseidon and meet the new enemy type, a cute little puppy. not quite as cute as they first appear. Now, God of War isn't a difficult game for the most part, but there are moments of extreme difficulty spike, and this is one of them. The Cerberus dog spits out smaller puppies, and if you don't kill the puppies in time, they themselves grow into big Cerberus dogs, which again spit out more puppies. Remember, every enemy has a strategy or preferred tactic. The Cerberus is the only enemy where not rigidly sticking to the strategy of kill the puppy first means you will die. You need to kill the babies first, no questions. And if you're ever in a group fight, poppies take priority over everything else. I die here a lot. Take on two more trolls and then a defensive push using a block. I like the visual flourish of the stone block having arrows sticking out of it, letting the player know this block can stop arrows. I love it when visuals reference mechanics. Slaughter the archers who were shooting at me and now a small seemingly safe room which turns slowly and opens a gate to reveal a chest which I grab and die. Right, this is the first trap I felt is unfair, and it kills the pacing of the game because you have no idea, no hint, this is even coming. There are three chests revealed in this room in this way as the room rotates, and you have to be super fast to grab them and then roll back. So far, the architect has been challenging, but never straight up unfair. Deaths, which are my fault, I'm okay with. I don't mind failing when I know what you want me to do. But deaths which are cheeky, ooh, gotcha, bet you didn't see that coming moments, they feel cheap. You don't feel the game has earned that victory against you, and the energy and the pacing, instead of being brought down, is just thrown all the way off. Next up, a new enemy type. Actually, the first type to not get an intro animation. These guys have swords and scythes. They don't play any differently to normal human-shaped guys, except the circle quick time event sees you run them through with their own swords, then give them a swift kick to the calf so they fall on their own blade. I also love how you can see the giant chain holding the temple to Kronos. This is a nice reminder of the scale of this entire environment. Sneaky creep around the corner gets us the second hidden muse key, and I'll need to remember to unlock that room later. Now here's a graphical touch I adore, and it relates to earlier when I said there's always something going on beyond Kratos. Sneaking around the ledge, you can actually see Kronos crawling below. Now for the time, this was an incredible graphical trick. I remember the original team wanted a sequence where you fought along the titans back as they were moving and you could see the distant vistas, but this proved to be way too demanding for the PS2 at the time. So this small scene, this tiny shot, is actually super impressive for the time. But don't worry, when the PS3 was finally released, the whole fighting along a titan's back as they climb a mountain, that was literally the opening sequence of God of War 3. We fight back inside and reach this ominous looking room, alive soldiers suspended in cages, a crank missing a handle, and a long run up a slope to the end room with two flaming walls 
and a note from a dying soldier saying what the gods ask no man could do. Pulling this lever brings the flames closer and... Right, I see. We need to offer a burning man as a sacrifice to carry on. This means grabbing the handle from the top room, going back down, lowering a cage, and then dragging that cage up the slopes. Now, if you stop dragging the cage, it slides back down, which is a problem. But you've got these lumps of debris which act as stoppers. But you're also being attacked by enemies, and the guy in the cage is begging you not to do this. That's multiple mechanical, combat, and emotional narrative problems all making this fight up the sloped room one intense experience. Seriously, the next time you're playing any game and you think, oh, this bit's really good, ask yourself, how many small problems, both mechanical, visual, emotional, audio, or combat-wise, are you dealing with at any one time? Chances are, it's always more than one. We place the cage at the top and pull the lever, burning the guy alive and revealing the sanctum of Poseidon, which gives us the trident and unlocks the swimming ability. You can breathe underwater indefinitely and the controls are pretty basic, up, down and horizontal movement. Thankfully, unlike Devil May Cry, there is no underwater combat. You do have a dash move that winds up and then boosts you forward which can smash through weak walls. And eventually we finally collect enough orbs to max out the Blades of Chaos and hit level 5. This unlocks the Rage of Hercules attack. Press square once, then just press and hold it again. It is the best combo by a mile and the final hit always sends enemies flying. We've also got the L1 plus circle ground slam which is a massive AoE pushback. Now the Rage of Hercules combo is fun but this is also a slightly disappointing revelation because it's literally the best combo in the game. It does the highest damage of any combo and it can be animation cancelled with a block meaning it's now the best attack choice in every situation. And while the animation looks lovely and the impact feels good, having objectively the best choice all the time does somewhat kill the variety of tactics we've needed for various enemies up until now. Dive into Poseidon's underwater tunnels and find one of his daughters, the Naiads. Kratos does the only thing he can think of and kisses them. Honestly, as a kid, I never quite got the point of this, and I still kind of don't, but kissing the Naiads rewards Gorgon eyes and Phoenix feathers. Ah uh, yes, I see the designers were fans of the film Event Horizon. You need to speed swim through this terrifying bladed tunnel as the walls close in on you. And you need to use the boosts to make it, because you cannot swim fast enough without using them. So boosting isn't just about smashing walls, it's now about racing death. We fight through some more rooms, unlock some more hidden chests, and then find this corridor full of pots, which are super satisfying to smash. A combination of the particles flying and the crisp, clear sounds of them breaking. So, you know what, let's talk about the soundtrack. The soundtrack does such a great job of elevating this game. Every battle is scored with an intense, energy-filled fight beat, and the slower puzzles bring it down with ambient chanting and the ever-present thud of the steps of Kronos as he walks along the desert. It's done that thing where the music matches the emotion and the energy of the game so perfectly, you don't notice what's playing, you just know it feels right. And when the main theme kicks in toward the end of the game, framing one of the best moments in gaming, it's just beautiful, and we will get to that pretty soon. Follow the underwater tunnel and even more traps, this time racing against boards being pulled by chains, and if you're not fast enough, you'll get swept along and crushed against the wall. I like how even though swimming is incredibly mechanically basic, they have still worked out a way to use all of those mechanics in a puzzle. They've pushed the limit of five directions. And then this room, where escaping the temple isn't done by huge steps on these massive pillars rising out the water, that's actually a red herring. It's instead a secret hidden alcove in the base of one of the pillars, a little fake out, exactly the type of thing you know the architect would do which also loops us back round to the first room through the tunnel we saw earlier. The ability to swim means we can return to the inner puzzle ring and dive down to another skull door, which means we will need another skull. So we swim through into this grand lava-edged room, with a huge locked door at one end and a mechanical log cannon at the other. We don't need this yet, though. So we push on into the Trial of Hades. Each room here is more imposing than the last, and I love how the camera always flies back to let you take in the majesty of each new location, which lets you as a player notice the platforming elements or the hidden doors that you will reach later, and then it flies back in so exploration can begin on a more personal level. I also like how this massive statue of Hades is immersed in a pool of blood, and I love the extreme use of colour contrast, with the lava gutters having this bright orange bloom effect against the dull black grey of the steps. In fact, light plays heavily 
here, because the room at the top of these steps is too dark to enter, the shadows themselves forming a physical barrier. So now we begin the challenge of Hades to light up this room. It starts with centaurs with electric bow blades charging at us and we need to kill them, but they need to die on these highlighted areas specifically to charge the death altar. Each altar needs four kills. See, again, you've got two problems. It's not just kill centaurs, it's kill them on a very specific bit of floor and they move around a lot. Lovely example of stacked mechanics again. With the altar's charge, we unlock the labyrinth. A stark contrast to the open room battles before, this is a tight, claustrophobic corridor maze, with trapped floors opening to lava below, ambushes hidden around corners, arrow traps you can't even roll past, and this massive sliding block I narrowly avoid being crushed by. The exit door states, Hades demands all the souls in this maze be killed, so once everything is dead, we loop back around to the main altar room and the giant statue rises out of the pool of blood. We dive all the way to the base, flip a switch to illuminate the mouth of the statue, and then spin it round to pierce the darkness and shine the way down an impossibly long corridor filled with flaming boulders. And now, one of the harder traps. You need to run against these boulders, and they're fast. Now there are doors to the side of this corridor, but I'm not risking trying to open them while these boulders keep rolling. Now this is quite the challenge, but I'm not sure if this is an intended hitbox mechanic or a glitch, but if you roll into the wall as a boulder passes, you'll avoid all damage. Eventually we make it all the way to the end and I find a book. More writings by the architect. He says, there are eight dead ends and one safe exit. Which means those doors by the side you need to open them while the boulders keep rolling. This challenge is razor tight with its timings. You need to mash R2 to open the doors and you've got just enough time, if you wait for a large enough gap, to open a door and then roll into the alcove. Thankfully, even if you choose the wrong door, there'll still be a gap to hide behind. With the right door found, we run through and reach the highest level of the original statue room and now it's balancing time. Notice how this one room has featured a combat puzzle with a specific area to fight in, a light puzzle with swimming mechanics and now a balanced puzzle with slow methodical movement. That's a lot of emotions all within one room. Balancing across the beams is one problem, but there's never just one problem because now you've got spinning blades to deal with. What I do like is the visual touch of having the cut and scratch marks on the end of the walkable beams so you know where the hazard blades extend to. That's a sign that the designers didn't want to kill you unfairly. They wanted you to have all the information you needed to take on the puzzle. And death is your fault. We cross all the beams and unlock the chained minotaur gate in the log cannon room, so we head down some broken stairs and return, and we meet the next boss. I love the design of this boss, because there are so many small touches which all combine. It's a massive armoured up minotaur, so the health bar is also armoured. But we can't hurt it right now, your attacks at this stage just damage the armour, and it's steam powered and eventually you break one of its four valves, which again are shown on its in-game model and its health bar. And when all four valves are broken, a quick time event sees you ripping off its armour as best you can and stunning the beast, and then while it's stunned, you use the giant log cannon to blast away chunks of metal plates. And as the armour breaks and the boss's flesh becomes more exposed, so does the hit point bar. You see the armour fly off that and the green start to show through. If you hide at the back of the upper ledge, the Minotaur charges and lava sprays from under you, so there's no respite from the fight either. Thankfully, you can kind of cheese Poseidon's Rage, the magical attack, to get some invulnerability frames during those big attacks. With all the Minotaur's armour finally chipped away and the beast stunned for a final time, we fire the log cannon one last time. What I think is so brilliant about this boss is the fight wasn't just combat, it wasn't just a quick time event and it wasn't just platforming or environmental interaction, it was a combination of all of them. 
with a graphically updating enemy health bar to reflect your progress. We head through the opened Minotaur door and ascend the stairwell to the tomb of the architect's second older son. It seems building the temple and his service to the gods claimed most of his family's lives. And now you can see his madness begin to spiral. A note even says he begins to doubt the gods. So, needing the skull for a door, we rip off the second son's skull and then head back to the inner ring to open one of the final doors. But on the way, we meet Hades. Lord Hades. Your progress is impressive, Kratos, but your skills will not carry you to your ultimate goal. I offer you the souls of Hades itself, the souls of the dead, who stand ready to fight by your side. Take this weapon, Kratos. Take this power and use it to defeat your enemies. The army of Hades spell is much more expensive using more than half our mana, but the ghostly spirits it calls forth are extremely useful. We'll actually need this for the final boss. Back in the central puzzle ring, we open the inner door using the second son's skull, and now we must spin and line up all three layers of interlocking rings. And while I was doing this, I was thinking, this is a cool concept, but why is it a bit boring? And it's not just because it's downtime, it's because this is another moment with only one problem to solve. Just solve it three times, spin three rings using three handles, and there's no way you can fail. Nothing to make it harder or more complex. No second problem to solve at the same time, it's just tedious. Oh, remember the Muse keys we found? Well, we can unlock the Muse door and find a hidden room which increases our health, magic, and gives us a ton of red orbs. With all the rings lined up, we push this diamond back together and the temple ascends. The game warns you that once you ascend to the higher levels, you cannot return without the box, so we head on up. This giant statue hand delivers us to the next section and another new enemy, this Anubis looking fellow with a double headed axe thing. These guys always had a very Egyptian feel to me and felt somewhat out of place with the rest of the Greek aesthetic, but they're extremely fun to fight mechanically, blocking a lot of our attacks and staying at a distance before darting in. So we take this dude out and then even more memories. Kratos had been in service to the gods long enough to know the Harpy had been sent as a warning, a reminder from his former master of the decision that had cost Kratos everything. Had it been that long since he'd almost met his end at the hands of the barbarians? That long since he'd traded everything to save himself? Ares! The sky split apart and the god of war stepped through. Descending from Olympus, he saw the makings of a god in a mere mortal. Ares would save Kratos. He would turn him into the perfect warrior, his servant on Earth. Only a simple pledge of loyalty was required. My life is yours, Ares. From this day, I shall carry forth your will. And his fate was sealed. As promised, Ares rescued his new disciple, bringing forth the power of a god, destroying those who would slaughter Kratos and his men. As for Kratos, and only a sword and shield would befit the newest servant of the god of war.
The blades of chaos, forged in the foulest depths of Hades. Once attached, the chains remained so, chained and seared to the flesh, a part of the bearer's body, a permanent reminder of Kratos' pledge. In return, ultimate power. The rage of Ares exploded from within. But soon, he would learn the true cost of such power. A cost too high even for Kratos to pay. Wretched beast! I know who it is you serve! Return to your master! Tell the god of war I am his no longer. Tell him he is not safe while I walk the earth. I will find Pandora's box. And I will use it to see him tremble and fall before me. And now you know the origin of the Blades of Chaos, a cruel gift from Ares to mark our eternal servitude to the God of War. From the inner machinations of the Rings of the Pandora puzzle to the vertical maze of the Cliffs of Madness, this entire area is a big outdoor collection of multiple smaller loops which all join up together. It's the closest the game ever gets to an open freeform exploration bit. Here's a lovely little puzzle. You need to cross this room so there's a bridge, but the bridge is split into two smaller circular bridges, so you need to use this lever to spin them round. But when you release the lever, they spin back, so you need to overspin and then run and then jump in the middle of the overspin, and while all this is happening, enemy archers are shooting at you. So many small problems. The ultimate goal of the Cliffs of Madness section is to find two necklaces, one for a statue of Hera, the other for a statue of Aphrodite, and use them to activate a bridge. And this also gives us one of the more unique puzzles. Once you've cleared this room of enemies, you need to play Tetris. And no, I'm not joking. You need to fit all these blocks into this wall somewhere, but you've also got a rotating floor so you can spin the blocks round. And just to fake you out, you don't need every block. One of them is extra. Finishing the Tetris wall will get you the first necklace. The rest of this area is extensive, but samey. It's a lot of running, lots of climbing, and a lot of fighting. And while it's fun to play, nothing new happens for about an hour, where this room appears. Clearly a spike trap floor with a movable block. So we activate a switch, grab the block, and now we need to race against the timer to get the block around a corner to a ledge. Again, count the problems. Need to move block, climb up on ledge, and it's timed, and failure means spiky death. This gets us the second necklace, and placing them both onto the bridge heads, we get an almost complete bridge, but you need to jump, but the ledges we revealed also move. Again, two problems. Not only do we need to jump back and forth, you need to time those jumps. The simple design choice of having the bridge be moving instead of static elevates this puzzle from forgettable platform bit to quite fun set piece. And at the very top, we get another flashback. The path before Kratos was clear, but still... The memories came rushing back, as familiar and permanent as the blades chained to his wrists. Memories of what he'd done in the name of Ares. Memories of how he'd become a servant to the god of war. A beast. His humanity robbed and replaced only with the will to murder. No one was safe. Entire armies fell before Kratos, and the soldiers who followed him on his unending path of conquest, all in the name of his master. Those who offered resistance of any kind were dealt with quickly. They've built this temple to offer prayers to Athena! This entire village stands as an affront to Lord Ares! Burn this village! Burn it to the ground! Emboldened by the god of war, Kratos' army was ruthless, feared throughout the world for their brutality. All that mattered was conquest in the name of Kratos, their great leader, who had become near invincible. He feared nothing. But there was something about this temple, something forbidden. All his instincts told him he should never cross its threshold. Never step inside. Beware, Kratos. The dangers in the temple are greater than you know. But the village oracle's warning fell on deaf ears. His ambition would not be denied. All who opposed him would die. <laughs> He 
In that instant, the glory he had reveled in turned to horror. The image of his two final victims would stay with him for all his days. With that act, Kratos knew he could no longer serve his master. He had but one calling now, the death of Ares. He would murder the god of war. I think you know who those final two victims were, but we don't have proof yet. Remember that memory though, the village, the forbidden church, the warning, it will return later. Atop the cliffs, a double rope swing gets us to the architect's tomb and what a sight it is. A button, a locked door, moving platforms, spinning blades and all of it timed. But this area is so much more than it looks. We need to move a statue onto a button to release even more locks, but then there's an odd section of cracked ground so we explore more and find a giant crane with a block payload so we drop it through the floor and smash into a cave with another button but this is just the first step because you now need to place the original statue from the first button onto the newly found button and use the crane to depress the first button the statue was on and oh it just loops back onto itself so nicely and now a jumping puzzle crossing these slabs while avoiding the blades your single jump isn't quite far enough but your double jump overshoots so it's an awkward middle ground distance and i die here a lot in fact, I die so much that I discover the sympathy mechanic. The game asks me if I'd like to reduce the difficulty. Doing this only affects combat, and no, I'm meant to be a professional. We're staying as we are. Eventually, we fight our way into the architect's tomb and find a grisly sight. A woman stabbed through the chest, slumped over a table covered in plans and a note from the architect saying she tried to stop me. So we have a man tasked by the gods to work a life of servitude whose insane focus and refusal to quit claims the life of his family and then in a blind rage after she tries to help him, he kills his wife. Up to this point, the temple has been your enemy and the architect has been the creator of your potential failure. But now as you stand in his tomb, you feel an odd connection, a respect that one professional feels toward another even if on opposite sides of a conflict. You're both men with ego and vision who lost everything to the whims of the gods. And in a lovely touch, you can examine the tables around the edge of the room and see sketches of the traps and puzzles throughout all of the temple. To unlock the final door, we rip the wife's skull from her corpse and slam it into the lock and then face the final room. A horrible mix of moving floor, alternating directions, all leading to rolling crushes, archers, standing on the only safe bits which will spew flames at you if you stand on them, and imps dive bombing you and knocking you around. This room is a test of patience. Every tactic you can think of is countered either by the enemies or the environment, but eventually you will clear the room and head on up. But just before you reach the final section of the temple, take note of the floor. There's an image of a man battling Zeus, and if you examine it, the game says it's an image of the future. Nice bit of shadowing for God of War 2 there. Very nice touch. Finally, we reach the highest room and find Pandora's box. Kratos, your quest is at an end. You are the first mortal to ever reach Pandora's box. There is still time to save Athens. You must bring the box back to my city and use it to kill Ares. Return to Athens, Kratos. Return and save my city. And then, in a beautiful example of the final loop of this puzzle temple, the floor descends and you end up right back at the start. Unfortunately, your acquisition of the chest hasn't gone unnoticed. After a thousand years, Pandora's box was at last freed of its confines. Kratos had found the means to destroy the god of war. Far away in Athens, Ares knew Kratos had succeeded in his quest. So, little Spartan, you've recovered Zeus's precious box, but you will not live long enough to see it opened. I will see to that. <laughs> Goodbye, Spartan. You will rot in the depths of Hades for all eternity. As the life began to leave Kratos, 
His thoughts return to that fateful night. Even in death, the memories, the visions would not fade. For how could he forget spilling the blood of his own family? A cruel trick orchestrated by the guard of war. My wife, my child, how they were left in Sparta. You are becoming all I'd hoped you'd be, Kratos. Now, with your wife and child dead, nothing will hold you back. You'll become even stronger. You will become death itself. But as the flames consumed the temple, Kratos realized his true enemy was the god who once saved his life. The same god who had now taken everything from him. Ares! From this night forward, the mark of your terrible deed will be visible to all. The ashes of your wife and child will remain fastened to your skin. Never to be removed. And with that curse, all would know him for the beast he had become. His skin white with the ash of his dead family. The ghost of Sparta had been born. In the end, in death, he had failed. As the minions of Ares claimed Pandora's box, Kratos's life faded and his cursed soul was cast into the fires of Hades. And Kratos fell into the underworld, the river Styx beckoning below, the current strong enough to carry even the strongest mortal to his eternal resting place. But Kratos had no intention of resting yet. He intended to live, to return to Earth and complete his quest. Let go, fool! You won't drag me down to that cursed river! There is a task left for me above. I will see it completed. You again? Oh look, it's the boat captain. Lovely little callback. Now, as a kid, I remember the whole Hades section being really, really long, but that's not actually the case. The entire thing from start to finish is about 30 minutes, but the difficulty spike is insane. The platforming gets way more demanding. You've got loads of consecutive precision jumps, then traversing spinning flesh pillars, avoiding the blades sticking out from them, while also avoiding archers with exploding arrows and imps dive bombing you and knocking you off the edge. And these rotating pillars change speed and direction too, which all adds up to many, many small problems, each compounding the last. Regular enemies are now super powered lava versions of themselves, hitting for way higher damage and having way more health. It's difficult, but it's familiar at least right up until this bit, the vertical spinning bladed climb. If you played God of War back in 2005 and you made it to Hades, this is the bit you remember. This is the bit you hated. These sections rotate. You can't get dragged into the wall because you'll fall off, and you can't get hit by a blade because you'll fall off, and you can't move diagonally because the game isn't programmed to let you do that, and a single mistake knocks you all the way back down to the start, and there are two of these huge columns to climb. Now saying you can't climb diagonal is sort of wrong, you can't move diagonally, but by holding up and then left or right at the same time, you can somewhat mitigate the sideways movement of the spinning column. So it's not full diagonal movement, but it kind of acts as if it is. Amazingly, getting to the top only takes me a few tries. I either got very lucky, or this isn't as hard as I remember it being. We kill several waves of the Anubis-style enemies, and with each one killed, it spawns a pillar to rise in the distance. Eventually enough pillars form a path for you to jump along, and then a block descends from above. We jump up and grab the rope and climb out of Hades all the way back to Athens, and then the gravedigger from earlier appears. Who is this guy? Ah, Kratos. And not a moment too soon. I only finished digging just a moment ago. Who are you? Now that is an interesting question. But for now, you must hurry. Athens needs you. But how did you know I was- Athena isn't the only god keeping watch on you, Spartan. Complete your task, Kratos, 
and the gods will forgive your sins. I'm still amazed that all of Hades only took half an hour. I remember it lasting so much longer. Back in Athens, but without Pandora's box, we fight through the ruined Oracle's temple to find the Oracle herself lying in a puddle of blood, saying that we failed and there is no hope. So we head down the steps to confront Ares, even if it might be completely futile. Kratos had traversed the desert of lost souls, bested the deadly traps of Pandora's temple, and escaped Hades itself. There was but one task left. Zeus! Do you see now what your son can do? You cast your favor on Athena, but her city lies in ruins before me. And now, even Pandora's box is mine. Would you have me use it against Olympus itself? Kratos returned even from the underworld. Is this the best you can do, father? You send a broken mortal to defeat me, the god of war? After thousands of years, Pandora's box was finally open. The power of the gods unleashed. Still just a mortal. Every bit as weak as the day you begged me to save your life. I am not the same man you found that day. The monster you've created has returned to kill you. You have no idea what a true monster is, Kratos. didn't expect the lightning bolt because he didn't expect the other gods to be helping us. The power of Pandora's box seems to be become really big and now we start the final one-on-one -on -one battle with Ares. The camera angle is now much lower to emphasize the size increase and the tiny coastal city of Athens burns in the corner as we fight in the open bay. The only problem with this fight is, as epic as it sounds and looks, it's just not fun to play. This final fight makes two major mistakes. First off, there's only one problem kill Ares in one-on-one -on -one combat. There's no environmental relevance, no additional enemies to change up tactics, no timer, no advantage to be gained. It's just a simple fight. And that leads to the second major problem. The game is not equipped to make a one-on-one -on -one slugging match the best experience. You've had a whole game of gaining skills and platforming and solving multiple puzzles at the same time. You've had a whole game of really pushing the mechanics to the limit and it all comes down to hit Ares a lot. Certain times you'll get quick time events like mash O and then press the correct keys, but even that they've made a mistake with. The change from mash O to press the specific key is so quick and tight, you'll still be mashing circle and often fail the first specific key press. It just feels lacking. Like all the amazing mechanics and stacking problems you've built on until now, this is just the most basic way to have a final boss fight. Eventually you do hurt him enough and Ares drags you by the blades into a small nightmare dimension where you have to survive one of the coolest moments in video game history. And this bit almost makes up for how bad the rest of the Ares fight is. The nightmares that had haunted Kratos for the past ten years had now taken form and substance. His past stood before him. You can put in my way to stop me. I will save my family.
Kratos' nightmare, the memory that haunts him, the single defining moment he cannot forgive himself for, Ares uses it against him. But Kratos fights back against himself. You have to defend your family from waves of nightmarish Kratos clones as the church, the ground, indeed the very reality where you killed your family is torn away. And as the clones overwhelm you, you can hold circle to hug your family and transfer your life force into them. The music swells, your family screams for you to save them, and finally you can atone and fight for your own forgiveness. Clones of you with the Blades of Chaos, clones of you with the Blade of Artemis, even ranged clones of you throwing lightning bolts on small islands floating around the edge of this battle. But eventually, you succeed. However, you cannot change the past, and Ares rips the Blades of Chaos from you, disarming you and throwing them back into your family once again. But even though you're there on your knees disarmed, you are not done yet, because you spot the massive sword bridge you ran over earlier. The battle was not over. The guards, it seemed, had a final gift for Kratos. I still have allies in Olympus, Ares. Now, you will see how strong I am. And now it begins, the actual final battle, one on one, Kratos versus Ares, and it is awful. Why does Ares have bladed wings that suddenly sprout from his back? Also, what happened to the Blade of Artemis? Are we just forgetting we have that? By taking our Blades of Chaos away and giving us a new weapon, we have a new moveset, but you have no time to become familiar with that moveset because you're in a boss fight, and your moveset doesn't matter because jumping here is a bad idea anyway. So we have a brand new weapon that we're unfamiliar with, placed into a one-on-one -on -one fight the game isn't really designed to work well for. It's a single problem to solve, and on top of that, the game really does commit to one of the worst design choices for what's meant to be an action-packed, adrenaline fueled sequence. Ares is really hard to kill. His moveset is crazy fast. He can break your guard, catch your rolls, stun lock you and push you back. He is faster and stronger than you. And you share a health bar. This is the only time the game does this. It's more of a kaiju battle. Hurting Ares adds health to you. You getting hurt adds health to him. So it's a constant back and forth slugging match with no real tactics. But the worst aspect is you die a lot, and the pacing, which up until now has been almost perfect, is completely ruined. Until now, the game has kept you on this knife edge of adrenaline, narrowly winning, just about losing, deaths felt fair, retries felt cathartic, but this final fight has you die so many times, it swings from challenging straight into frustrating. And unfortunately, it has to be said, it is a terrible game design decision to make the final experience that a player has of your game one of frustration. Put very simply, the last fight just isn't fun because it hasn't been built up to in any kind of mechanical way. There is nothing in this fight that you think, oh my god, I really enjoy that mechanic, I'm glad I get to use it again. But eventually, after an 18 minute slugging match, Ares goes down. It was I who saved you in your time of greatest need. I haven't forgotten, Ares. I remember how you saved me. That night, I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. <laughs> Kratos had done me impossible. A mortal defeating a god. Ares was no more. The city had been saved and would thrive again. 
The same could not be said for Kratos, for as he sought to rebuild his soul with the help of the gods, the truth was revealed to him. Athena, rid me of the memories that haunt me still. You have done well, Kratos. Though we mourn the death of our brother, the gods are indebted to you. We promised your sins would be forgiven, and so they are. But we never promised to take away your nightmares. No man, no god could ever forget the terrible deeds you have done. In the end, knowing the visions of his past would never leave him, Kratos made his way to the bluffs overlooking the Aegean Sea. The gods of Olympus have abandoned me. Now there is no hope. Classic Greek tragedy twist. The gods are cruel. You've been forgiven, but not forgotten. And unable to live with himself, the final loop is now complete, and we watch Kratos fall to his death. Ten years of endless nightmares. It would finally come to an end. Death would be his escape from madness. The fate of Kratos was not as it seemed. The gods had other plans. Born aloft like a feather, Kratos found himself risen from the sea and placed on solid earth. You will not die this day, Kratos. The gods cannot allow one who has performed such service to perish by his own hand. Ares' tactics were brutal. His path of destruction had to be stopped. But now there is an empty throne in Olympus, and a new god of war is needed. Take these stairs, Kratos. They lead to your ultimate reward. But death? does not come so easy. Hauled back up to the cliffs, you step through a portal and arrive on Mount Olympus with an empty throne to fill and no one better suited. Your blades of chaos are replaced with the blades of Athena and you take your rightful place as the new God of War. And from that point forward, throughout the rest of time, Whenever men rode forth to battle for good cause or for evil, they did so under the watchful eye of the man who had defeated a god. They were driven forward by Kratos, the mortal who had become the new god of war. Story done, credits roll, but that's not the end of the game. You've now unlocked God Mode and the treasures menu, secret behind the scenes making of stuff, some of which is itself locked behind finishing God Mode or the challenge of the gods, which is 10 small challenges in a row, such as knocking enemies off this platform without killing them, beating some time limits or not getting hit for a few waves. Completing the Challenge of the Gods unlocks some joke cosmetic armor sets you get to replay the game in, including a chef, a fish, or the armor of Ares. But here is one of the strangest secrets. If you do go back through the entire game on God Mode, after killing Ares and ascending Mount Olympus, you'll pass these two statues just before the final throne. If you spend an unreasonable amount of time attacking the statues, you will unlock two secret messages. In the European version, both are accessed through the treasure menu. In the American version, you unlock a phone number. Now, I don't believe this number is still active, but if you did call it back in the day, you got this. By the gods, you've done it. Somehow you found your way here to me. I offer you my congratulations and my respect. Together, we shall conquer the perils that lay before us, and we shall always... Kratos, dude, dude, they did it. They found our Easter egg. Who are you? It's me, David Jaffe. I directed the game. What game? Your game, God of War. Go away or I'll... Dude, dude, dude. Don't, don't you get it? These guys, they spent all that time breaking those statues. I mean, they must have taken, like, forever. And then they figured out the whole secret code thing. 
I do not know what you are talking about. We hid this secret pretty damn deep, huh, Kratos? If I kill you, I will get health orbs. But wait, 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 wait. If you got the secret from the net or a magazine, then actually you kind of suck. I mean, work for it a bit, right, Kratos? Actually, can I call you Crate? No. Go away or I'll Don't you hate it when they get the codes off the net? It's so lazy. Hey, say, Crate, what, what are you so pale for? I am serious. You know, up close, you actually look kind of pasty, if you don't mind me saying. It's it's kind of gross. All right, that's it! Ah! Oh, jeez, Crate, what are you doing? What are you doing? Ah! Crabbit, it hurts! Ah! We gotta make the sequel! Ah! He was worse than a screeching harpy! <clears throat> As I was saying, you have found the secret. You have done well. Congratulations, mortal. We will meet again. So, with God of War fully replayed, we can finally ask, was it any good? Put simply, yes, extremely. The linear nature of the game's critical path is enhanced by the small but constant loops of secrets and crisscrossing puzzles. The combat is fast-paced and brutal while being kept varied by the enemies themselves having strengths and weaknesses, and each encounter stacking enemy types and environmental challenges, sometimes with time limitations or combinations with block puzzles, to mean you're never facing just one problem. The combat system itself isn't just button mashing, it's dodging, blocking, reacting and adapting with spells and weapon choices as you go, leading to some beautiful quick-time kills with no camera cuts. Pandora's Temple is a gorgeous environment and easily one of the most memorable adventure temples in gaming. The stacking challenge of combining combat, puzzles and varied environments means it's visually stunning and the incredible orchestral soundtrack enhances every moment. As a character, Kratos starts defeated. We see him for the arrogant but doubtful man that he is and ultimately learn of his selfish sacrifice of his own soul to Ares, leading to the ultimate selfless regret of killing his family in a blind rage. And then we get to lead him through his hard-fought redemption, but not forgiveness. Leading to an emotionally moving and mechanically awesome battle with yourself in Hades for what little redemption you can try and earn. The vast majority of the design of God of War 1 is simply fantastic, from the game itself to the plethora of extra content unlocked after finishing it. The only weak moment is the unfortunate final boss, which goes against almost everything you've learned in the game up to that point, doesn't relate to any upgrades you're involved in, and kills the pacing of a climactic ending. But if we can look past the absolutely abysmal Ares fight, we now need to give the game a score. When they set out to make God of War, they set out to create an incredible action-adventure game that one of the developers once described as the adventure the back of the box is always promising you. And I think... You succeeded. Thank you very much for watching. Another massive shout out to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch and YouTube who keep the channel alive. You can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and our Discord. And as always, remember... The gods of Olympus have abandoned. Now there is no hope.